Now on involved to... with the deer hunters. Now on to Chris Searle in festive mood provides a view of Christmas past from the windmill. Welcome to our Windmill Christmas special. We've got some real crackers for you. The team has raided the BBC Library's Aladdin's Cave department and found a big, beautiful box of treasure, the best of Christmas television from the past. There's a welter of Christmas comedy, not to mention the snow, this week, including two clips from the series which achieved the record for the biggest audience for a comedy show ever. Our guest, John Craven, will be remembering his Christmases and a special river journey in Panama. We take a look back to the television of 1949. Milk won't wait anywhere, not even in the car. And out in the country, farmers and their dairymen had the usual routine to observe. And to a home movie of the 30s, which shows that the spirit of Christmas presents never changes. And we look back to the morning a war stopped, because it was Christmas Day. Presently, the fog lifted very quickly. It lifted astoundingly quickly. And along that line, we were able suddenly to see the Germans doing exactly the same thing all out in the open. And I'll be singing a doubtful duet with the young cathedral chorister of the year. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Brightly shone the moon that night, though the frost was cruel. When a poor man came in sight, every winter through well. Right, I think that's enough snow for now. Thank you very much. That'll do. Thanks. Oh, right. Thank you, Francis. <clears throat> well, we start <laughs> with some important questions for young people at Christmas time. Who is Father Christmas really? And how does he deliver all those presents? And why don't children give presents? Well, John Pittman and Gerald Harrison found a wonderfully mixed level of credibility in the children they talked to. See, he's got a sleigh, a special sleigh, which goes up in the air. It's a magic one. But his other name is Santa Claus. Where does he come from? At the North Pole. And how does he get here? Sledge. Mm -hmm. oh, God, and the way, I don't know how he doesn't get dirty when he gets down the chimney. Oh. Yes. Who's Santa Claus then? I think it's my mother and father dressed up. Yeah. So. Dear, why do you think that? Well, because I don't know anybody else who can come in the house. So they came I don't hear the door creaking and everything. Why don't children give presents? They do give presents to Jesus when it's his birthday or Christmas Day. Uh, what sort of presents? All sorts of ones. Saying praise, going to church, don't talk at church, and be good and wash your plates up. And and when you go to Cousin's house, don't muck about. It is one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? How on earth does Father Christmas manage to do all those deliveries in one night? 
Well, we discovered that Dave Allen had been pondering over the problem too, and come up with a sort of time and motion study of his own. You, you look at the facts in Europe alone. There are nearly 150 million homes, and he goes through the lot in eight hours. <laughs> that means he lands on your roof, gets down your chimney, dumps the present, and is out in one five thousandth of a second. <laughs> are you surprised nobody sees him? <laughs> what was that red blur? Oh, look. <laughs> and in each house, he has a mince pie and a glass of sherry. <laughs> means that he eats three ton of mince pies <laughs> and drinks nearly a million gallons of sherry. <laughs> and then we don't see him for another year. Are you surprised? Dave Allen at large. Now, Christmas is also a time for gorging yourself on good things. We've found a documentary, one of the sort the television business refers to as fly-on-the-wall filming, where you hope people will behave naturally and forget there's a camera in the room. This one's all about a Christmas dinner in 1972. It's being prepared for a Dorset Village Old People's Club at the local. The kitchen is overloaded. So are the nerves of the owners and staff, all dressed up for the occasion. Now, the picture of anxious people in a tiny kitchen dodging each other has all the intricacy of a country dance. Partners, please, for the kitchen chaos, hokey cokey. You mustn't keep them waiting. Try and hurry, will you? So I'll bring it back for you. Uh, now, how's my prawn cocktail story? There were two on each one. Did you see? Yeah, well, I want some more. Yeah, there's one, one but this we're all getting in a hell of a mess. One portion of soup, please. I'll take the next one. Can I? There's just two. We put some on top there. Yeah. 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 Well, it's the second one got the first course. Have they all, have they all got the start of the first course? No, we're doing them. What is it from? Prawn well, cocktails. I wish I could put this long dress on. <laughs> Can I take anything for you? There's some, some vegetables in there. If they're going to serve extra vegetables, right? Um, I can take these, you know, yes. and then they I haven't well. put any creams or any salad. Right. Mrs. Wills, will you take the vegetables? No, I'll take the vegetables. Creams and celery, take something off. Counted the plates. Don't you know me? Right. Right, I'll go around with the wine then. Six grand, yes, I done that. Six of them. Do you know what Andy said? No. He said that if you're waiting, was anything like you can, then the one that's good. What's he saying? You're miserable. Don't worry about it. Yeah, sorry, no. Commander Carl. You've all got glasses charged. I'd like to take the opportunity of wishing you all a very happy Christmas. It's nice to be all together once again. Happy Christmas, everybody. From real life chaos to Michael Crawford. Miss Pilbin's attack of mumps means she can't act the part of the angel Gabriel in the village nativity play. There's no one to replace her for the last rehearsal, except the man who built the scenery. You've guessed it, Frank Spencer. It's a cold night, brother. The sheep are restless. Pull that hard. What's that strange noise I hear? Oh, not that hard. That made my eyes water. <laughs> music. A heavenly choir. Right, up a bit. Up a bit more. Right a bit. One more bag should do it. What's that? Up there. <laughs> you dirty shepherd. <laughs> and you on the back. <laughs> Come and Jessica.
Baker's eyes. The angel of the Lord. I bring you... I bring you good tidings of great joy to all men. No, the angel descends. Right. No! What goes up must come down, even angels. A film on The Tonight Programme in 1963 investigated the disappearance of the 46 huge plastic angels which had decorated Regent Street in London three years before. Then they'd cost a colossal £12,500. Inquiries revealed that they'd been flogged to Manchester Council for a knockdown price, £3,500. Now, after the angels had spent one Christmas parked in a cow shed, the sleuths of the Tonight programme followed their flight path to a town in Nottinghamshire, where their earthly value was now reduced to a paltry £250. The reporter who followed the 46 angels fall from grace was Julian Pettifer. From Regent Street, London to Regent Street, Mansfield. Fallen angels? But in one sense, they certainly are, but the decline started a long time ago when they were still living in the big, wicked city. Whoever built them forgot to stall any drainage, so that when it rained, the water ran right up their skirts and uh, formed a little reservoir around their midriff. This, of course, made them an unfortunate bulge, and the angels soon earned themselves a nickname. Well, something had to be done about it, so a man was sent down Regent Street with a long pole, with which he punctured them and relieved them of their trouble. After that, they earned a different nickname. The streets here are much narrower, which is perhaps a disadvantage. Their faces have a distinctly superior look. Maybe they'll all feel better when they've been officially switched on. The ceremony on the steps of the town hall is conducted by the Mayor of Mansfield, Councillor A. H. Bailey, supported by the town clerk, Mr. Christmas. Have hung decorations in the main streets, near the centre of the town for the festive season. And it now gives me the greatest pleasure to switch on. And so the mayor throws the symbolic switch. Symbolic because the flex doesn't actually lead anywhere. It ends as two bare wires in the public lavatory down below. This is an automated switch on with a difference. Signalman number one sees the mayor switch on and flashes his torch to signalman number two in Church Street. From Church Street, the signal goes to White Hart Street, from there to Market Street, Stockwell Gate, Westgate, and finally to Regent Street, Mansfield. A complicated chain of command, and one which gave the organizers a few worried moments. But in the end, it worked. And in the end, the pleasure given by the lights is just the same. Christmas has inspired literally hundreds of seasonal television programs. And the BBC's library has kept so many of them, it's impossible to do them all justice. So the windmill team has put together a short sequence to try and encapsulate a mood. It's a succession of shots from different programs, which simply say, Happy Christmas. <laughs>
For millions of families, Christmas Day will never be quite the same without Morecambe and Wise. So, our comedy classic this week is from Christmas Day, 1970. We'll see more of Morecambe and Wise later in the programme. Now, one of the oddest and most touching Christmas stories ever comes from the First World War. Any film from the 1914-18 war shows the terrible conditions the soldiers of both sides had to put up with. Millions died. It was described as the war to end all wars. Well, of course, unfortunately, it wasn't. But on Christmas Day, 1914, something happened which the generals back at HQ knew nothing about. The incredible scene was remembered more than 50 years later. Two ex-soldiers revisited one of the fields which had been devastated by shells and bullets. In the war, they'd been sworn enemies. In 1968, on a battlefield which had now become peaceful farmland, they were able to rekindle a special friendship which had only lasted a day. Presently, the fog lifted very quickly. It lifted astoundingly quickly. And along that line, we were able suddenly to see the Germans doing exactly the same thing all out in the open. And uh, we just looked at each other for some time, and then one or two uh, soldiers went towards them. They met, they shook hands, they swapped cigarettes, uh, they got talking, and... Uh, well, everything, uh, the war for that moment came to a standstill. And when we are taking our coffee and cake and you know, dug out, then suddenly a uh, lead jumped in and cried, the tummies come on and ours are also going upstairs. We spoke about the things a soldier has on his mind then we exchanged presents, cigarettes, tobacco, cigars, cognac, whiskey, and so on. Suddenly a Tommy came with a football, kicking all ID and make fun. And then began a football match. We marked our goals with our caps. Tommy's did also. And we uh, had much kicking and then after all, uh, the Germans won the football game with three to two. I think it was very moving because one had been looking at that part of the country as something dangerous to tread into unless it was quite dark. To be able to walk about in it in daylight was quite a sensation, having uh, treated it as something uh, uh, that you didn't tread on in daylight without expecting to get killed. When we heard the Englishmen, we began to sing also louder and louder, and all at once it was like a hymn that arose out of the trenches to the sky. Christmas was a thing that united the enemies. And it is wonderful to think that the thought of Bethlehem would unite the men. The men heard the voice of 2,000 years back, but the rulers did not hear. And so war went on for four years, and millions of young men to die. I have to die. The spirit of Christmas and goodwill reaching out even to the trenches of the First World War. One of the carols the soldiers sang on that one happy day of the war was Silent Night, originally a German song. When King's College Choir sing it in their candlelit festival of carols, they do something which would have been unthinkable during that terrible conflict. They sing it in German. <laughs>
festival of nine lessons and carols from 1969. Now, someone who's probably sung more like 900 carols this year is also our first star guest on our Christmas windmill. He's the young cathedral chorister of the year, and his name's Jeremy Unwin. Very warm welcome, Jeremy. Where do you sing? What choir do you sing in? Um, Westminster Cathedral Choir. All right. Now, what did you have to do to win this award? Well, um, we went to a church um, in the city, and um, the semi-finals... Then the finals, right? And then they um, told you who'd won, the third, second, and first. I was the first. It sounds like Miss World competition. Were you terribly anxious when they were giving the results? I bet you were. Yes, I was. Right, but you must have been thrilled, skinny, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and your family and everything. Yeah. Now, what effect has, has it had on you? Do you think? It's given me a lot more confidence in the past since the competition. Right. Now, with Christmas coming up, you must have had a lot of extra singing duties to do with your choir. You've got carols coming out of your ears, haven't you? Right. Yeah, I have. Right, I'm sure you have. Well, one of the most popular carols is the holly and the ivy. And Jeremy's going to sing it for us in a moment. But I didn't know just how old a carol it is. The fact is, it's a dance from pagan midwinter festivals. Holly means good luck and boys. The ivy means fertility and girls. Now, Alice and Claire, in her award-winning series, The Song and the Story, discovered that the holly and the ivy used to be sung to a different tune from the one we know now. In Tudor times, families used to dance to it. Oh, the holly and the ivy, now they are both full grown. Of all the trees that are in the wood, the holly, she bears the crown. Oh, the rising of the sun and the running of the deer, the playing of the Sweet singing all in the choir Well, the holly she bears a flower As white as any milk And Mary bore sweet Jesus Christ All wrapped it up in silk For the rising of the sun And the rounding of the deer The playing of the merry organ Sweet singing all in the choir Well, the holly she bears a berry As red as any blood And Mary bore sweet Jesus Christ To do for sinners good for the rising of the sun and the rounding of the deer, the playing of the merry organ, sweet singing all in the choir. A little glimpse of a family Christmas of 500 years ago. And Jeremy Unwin, young cathedral chorister of the year, is now going to sing the same carol, the holly and the ivy, but set to a much more familiar tune. He's accompanied by David Hill, master of music at Westminster Cathedral. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you. That was quite lovely. Well, this is where my in at the deep end instincts ought to tell me to stop while we're ahead. But uh, Jeremy's insisted that we sing a duet, him and me. I'm glad to say he's chosen an easy one. It's good King Wenceslas. But I should say, in case there's any doubt, most of the time you'll find that mine is the lower of the two voices. That's all I'm going to say. Good luck, everyone. David. <laughs> Wences last looked out on the feast of Stephen When the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even 
Congratulations on your award, and thank you, David. One of the best things about Christmas is the annual duel between ITV and BBC. They call it the ratings war. Now, for months, the planners sit hunched over their schedules, biting their biros, and scheming wickedly to make their Christmas programs more popular than the enemy's. Well, the result for us viewers is days and days of the best telly of the year. It's always been that way. And the BBC library is bursting with some of the most popular comedy ever. So no prizes for guessing what this week's mailbag is bursting with. Yes, it's request time. <laughs> The first one comes from uh, Natalie and John Meredith of Chiswick, and they say, the funniest programs are the ones which remind you of what a good time you've been having over Christmas, beavering away at party games. Has your library kept Dave Allen's wonderful charade sketch? Well, the answer is, you're in luck, Mr. and Mrs. Meredith. The world record for solving this charade, incidentally, is 10 seconds. Oh, my lady, it's Jerry and Porky. I say, let him act it out. Oh, come on. Oh, yes. Come on, you can do it. You know, come on, act it out. What do I do? How many words? How many words, John? Five. Five. Is it a play? Oh, say it. Say it, say it. Right. First word. Yes. Little one. Little one. The, the, the. First word, the. Drinking, drinking, oh, uh, drunk, drunk, uh, no, like, uh, blotto, blotto, uh, like blotto, um, uh, shorter, lotto, lotto, uh, um, housey, housey, uh, uh, shorter, house, house, the house, the house, the house, the house, the house, the Serpent sound. Uh, 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 uh,
Dave Allen from Christmas 1979. Now the next one, thank you for all your cards by the way, comes from Sue and Chris Scott of the Isle of Wight and they say, what about the sheer embarrassment of Hugh and Terry trying to persuade their neighbours to play a party game when they're not really interested? Okay, Sue and Chris, we've got it and it's from a programme shown on Christmas Eve 1964, all those years ago. Hugh Lloyd and Terry Scott and, well, friends. Ink. Pen. Blotting paper. <laughs> he said blotting paper. <laughs> Who's he? Mr Lloyd. What for? It's a game. <laughs> a game called blotting paper? <laughs> no, Cecil, no. no. You're starting something here, mate. It seems a pretty rum way to spend Christmas. Right, we'll start with Norma, then on to Mr. Crispin. Right, have you thought of something, Norma? Yeah. Oh, we'll try and think of something else. <laughs> right, right, off we go now. Beginning with Norma, then Mr. Crispin. Right, off we go. One, two, three. Party! Labour! What? <laughs> Party. Labour Party! Well, that's right. Right, you're out, Terry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait a minute, what well, do you mean out? Look, if you challenge somebody and they're right, then you're out. Well, look, we were only practising, weren't we? Let's uh, do it again properly. Right, all right, then. Okay. Just one more life. Okay, right, right, right. Right, we'll start with Mr. Christmas. Right, right, right. Ready, steady, go. Right. Fire! Um, water! Drink! Boozer! That's a good idea. Well, open Sit down! Oh, we don't know it. It's a game. Well, I'll word. explain it to you. We'll be here till Easter. Listen. Listen, you. Listen. Have you have you got rhythm? Got rhythm? Yeah. I'll show it to you. Look. One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, pause. Right. Now, in the pause, you have a word. See? Okay, one, two, three, and then you have a word, okay? One, two, three. What's your word? One, two, three. You're balmy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse than the party game when you really don't feel like it. Hugh and I there. Now, this card's from Paul Dickinson of Stockport, and it couldn't be uh, shorter or more to the point. The good life, please, it says. Well, Mr. Dickinson, thank you for your card. A couple of years ago, Margot's Christmas was ruined when the turkey she'd had delivered was just not up to standard. Well, of course, she sent it back, and the replacement, my dear, simply didn't arrive. Quite frankly, a disaster. Till Tom and Barbara next door came to the rescue. They invited Margot and Jerry to join in their ecology Christmas. Fun and games round the fireside. <laughs> Now, a real find. Films like the one we're going to see now are rarer than hen's teeth. This one dates back to a time when most television was live, and the library only ever kept a film, if it was of special importance, to use their words. Now, the snag is that you never know what people are going to think is important in 30 or 40 years' time. As a result, too many good films have been lost forever. But this one has survived. It dates from 1949, when the library was only a year old, and it's just solid gold. Apart from the link with Christmas, it also takes old codgers like me back to tiny black and white screens, and that distinctive smell of hot valves, which used to waft through the little slots at the back of the set. Waft yourself to Christmas 36 years ago, and wallow in this. Yes, it was a busman's holiday for many people. Even on Christmas Day, the wheels must not stop turning altogether. And while we were sitting, replete and cosy by the fire, unnamed heroes and heroines carried on the essential services that gave us our comfort and our safety. The milkman, for instance. He was early abroad on December the 25th, wheeling through the quiet streets, his trolley and his greeting. The milk won't wait anywhere, not even in the cow. And out in the country, farmers and their dairymen had the usual routine to observe. The postman had his rounds to make. Belated cards and parcels from thoughtless people who did not post early for Christmas. 
and there were still Sunday newspapers. The news agent and the paper seller were on the job. And speaking of news, there were the BBC services, with producers, announcers, artists and engineers all hard at work making other folks' holiday bright and musical. another and sadder kind of listening. No time for rest or merrymaking can be spared by those who fight against pain and disease, doctors, nurses and their many unseen helpers. No rest for those who stand by waiting for the urgent call of danger. 88 fire calls were answered on Christmas Day by brigades in the London area alone. And high up in the list of civic watchfulness after disease and danger comes dirt. And the scavenger was at work on Christmas Day doing his humble but essential duty. wondering for a moment how these pictures came to be taken, well, cameraman Mike Lewis, too, was just one of the world's workers on Christmas Day, 1949. Busman's holiday, shown on New Year's Eve, 1949. From an early and very professional television film to our weekly dip into the home movie archive. <laughs> Colour film was rare in the 1930s and the quality a bit dodgy, but this fragment of amateur film was shown in the series Caught in Time in 1977. It's all about Christmas shopping in London and James Cameron's commentary says all that need be said. There was, of course, the other aspect of Christmas, the commercial Christmas, the traders' Christmas, where everything, as now, was available to everyone at a price. Oxford Street in London was having its annual bonanza. It didn't seem so different in the 30s, except the prices and, of course, the people. Certainly the big facade of Selfridges hasn't changed very much. This, of course, is Hamley's in Regent Street. But gamages now, that's a thing of the past. I'd forgotten, if indeed I ever knew, that they used to have a real circus inside. Where could they have put it? You can still see this here and there, the pavement toy shop, all these madly ingenious clockwork things. Did they already come from Japan, I wonder? I don't like the look of that crawling toy baby, liable to be trodden on at any moment. But what hasn't changed, and probably never will, is the small children's wonderment at the sudden abundance of desirable things. Doubtless they'll learn by and by. Christmas was probably even more than it is now the children's occasion. Is it reasonable to feel that they were less sophisticated 30 years ago? Or do we just suppose that they should have been? Everything is bound to be new and wondrous when you're six. Well, now it's time to meet someone who is eminent, famous, and very nice with it. It's windmill guest time. <laughs> So we welcome the star of Newsround, Saturday Superstore, and all sorts of other good things, John Craven. Is, Hello, that, is that your scene? Do you think a pink Rolls Royce with a windmill on the front? Well, I don't really think so, but uh, I mean, if Santa brought me one, I wouldn't say no, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things about your Newsround programme is that you don't just sit in front of the camera reading the words, do you? You, you, you have quite a lot more to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm a working journalist in television, really. I, I write quite a few of the scripts for the programme. I mean, it's nothing unusual these days for national newsreaders to, to be journalists, but when, certainly when Newsround started, it was quite unusual. 
And, uh, and I was also the first newsreader ever to wear a jumper to read the news. A lot of people, a lot of elderly gentlemen in the shires of England didn't like the idea of a BBC man reading the news in a jumper. But, but now they all do it. So. Nobody turns <laughs> their head. That's right. That's right. Now, the other nice thing about your particular style of newscasting is that you, you get out of the studio. You get out and out sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Every few months, for being a good boy and sitting inside the studio, they let me out. And, uh, and I've been to some fascinating places. I'm, I'm very lucky. I've, been to, I've met some amazing people and seen some wonderful sights. And uh, one of the first ones was uh, in the middle of the 1970s. I went to uh, South America, to Panama, to take part in a thing called Operation Noah. What was happening? They were flooding a vast area of the Bayana River to create a new hydroelectric dam. All the native tribes had been warned about this, about the danger, and they were moving to higher ground. But nobody could possibly warn the animals what was going to happen, and they were all in great danger of drowning. So Operation Noah was launched to, to rescue the animals, and we went along and joined in the operation. Suddenly, we come across my first catch. It's a kind of raccoon called a Coati Mundi, and he wasn't too pleased about being rescued. In fact, he dived into the water to get away from us. We got him. Uh, get a bag, get a bag, get a bag. Right? Bag? Bag open. He's a young guy, but he bites, you know? Don't bite me. Nice. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> this is Gregory, our camp, Come on, Greg. our camp mascot. Gregory? He's a white collared peccary, and he's a, he's a docile animal. He's a lot of fun to have around. He's always tugging at your cuffs when he wants attention. And uh, unusually tame for a pecker. He's a terrific animal. He's sort of a camp mascot. He's a bit like... What, you treat him like a dog, really? Oh, sure. He's, he's a fine animal. Fine animal. Hello, Gregory. Oh! You can see he doesn't have trust. He knows how to use it if he has to. <laughs> Why do you call him Gregory? Because he's a peccary, a member of the wild pig family. Gregory Peccary! <laughs> Come on, Gregory. <laughs> you need a nasty nip from that peccary, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> We've rescued thousands and thousands of animals, and just in a few weeks, uh, Gregory and all the others were very lucky because uh, otherwise they'd have drowned. You know? and, and the Indians, the Kuna Indians, gave me this. This is a, a, a voting stick for their tribal uh, parliaments, and uh, we sat around in a big circle, and I, I don't speak Kuna, I don't know about you, Kuna Indian. Not fluently. It's no. not one of my languages. And uh, so every time that most people put their sticks up to vote, I put mine up as well. Uh, You've also met some very eminent people through News Round, and uh, one of the people you interviewed, and the person we're going to see now, is uh, Mother Teresa. This is during our trip to India last year on News Round, and obviously we wanted to meet uh, Mother Teresa if we possibly could, because she's so important to so many people. What was she like? Oh, she was wonderful. Uh, we, um, we had no promise that we would be able to talk to her, because uh, when we arrived in Calcutta, she happened to be there at the same time, although she travels all over the world. This tiny little lady is, in fact, really a, a big businesswoman because she's controlling an organization with 60 branches in as many countries a br uh, you know it's, it's a firm that it cares for people but it's still a big enterprise and she's in charge of it by herself and uh, on that one day uh, she wasn't feeling very well uh, and her helpers said well if we come back the next morning at a, about six o'clock in the morning after mass mother may speak to us and so we went back the next morning and she came out and she said, as it's for the children of Britain, I will talk to you. My first impression of Mother Teresa was how small and frail she is. But she has amazing stamina. The day before, she'd been in Delhi. The next day, she was flying to Rome. And although she was very busy and she wasn't feeling very well, she found time to show me round. It was early morning, and Mother and the 300 nuns who live here had just finished Mass and were preparing for the day ahead. How old were you when you decided you wanted to become a nun? Twelve years. And why? Because of the 
call of Jesus, no? It's a, that's between him and, and the soul itself. And it's very difficult to explain that. And did you ever imagine when you began your work here that uh, your mission would eventually become worldwide and that you would become so famous? Nothing at all. Fame has made the presence of the poor very much known. So there's in the world there is more concern, more awareness of their presence. Because they are connecting me with the poor and the poor with me. So in talking about me, naturally they speak about the poor. In helping me, naturally they are helping them. Mother Teresa's watchword has always been God will provide. And over the years, donations have come from many countries. The mash is made from wheat, rice, vegetables, egg powder, and spices. And there's enough to feed 2,000 people every day. And Mother Teresa told me that the money to pay for the bread at the center is raised by children in Britain. For these people, this is the only proper meal they will get today. God and Mother Teresa will provide. We only met her very briefly, Chris, you know, uh, but I think she's the most memorable person I've ever met, and uh, she was the person who was really sort of carrying the message of Christmas out to the whole world, really, I thought. A wonderful experience. That'll stay with you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a family Christmas at home? Yes, I'm very lucky, because Newsround is one of the few news bulletins in the world, I think, that takes a break at Christmas. Uh, so I have the chance of being at home with the family at Christmas time, and unlike a lot of my friends in the business, I don't go in for pantomimes and things like that, so I just stay at home and, and enjoy myself. Oh, yes, you do. You took part in a pantomime once, oh, remember? A telepantomime. <laughs> a telepantomime. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> for swap shop. That's right. Good old swap shop. Yeah. Yes. Now, here they come with gliding steps to greet their little sister. Just listen to their cheery cries. They're saying how they missed her. Sister dear, perhaps you'd like to try some. <coughs> a gal must always look her best to catch a fella handsome. Ah, what a flounce. Who okay. is flastering with stuff there? Uh, Noel somebody, I think it was. Noel somebody, <laughs> yes. The name rings a bell. <laughs> Definitely, yes. So you, you got up to some other silly stunts, haven't you? Um, in fact, you once were allowed to fulfill a long held ambition of yours. Right. Uh, now and again, people do expect newsreaders to be quite serious people. Again, we're allowed to let our hair down, and uh, I was working on a, on a record breakers Christmas special once, and uh, the producer said, uh, "What's your wildest dream? Everybody can have a wild dream come true." And I remember as a boy uh, going to the Leeds Empire Theatre and seeing all the tops of the bill, the big singing stars. They used to walk down a big staircase. Do you remember these sort of staircases they had? And the microphone would come out of the floor, and they would sing their big signature tunes. So that has always been one of my ambition, but unfortunately, I, I can't sing. I can't get that single note right. But uh, Alan Russell, the producer, said, oh, we'll make it all look wonderful. And uh, he did. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present the unique voice of superstar John Starlight, love unchanging and true. Call and I will be all you ask of me. Music in spring, flowers from a king. All these I bring. Singing Ivan Novello, dressed as Gary Glitter. And they never told me the microphone was going to move. They forgot to mention that, too. They forgot to mention And the orchestra played slightly out of key as well. Right. And the it wasn't shoes. just my voice. The, the shoes. shoes, the six inch heels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to say that uh, newsreaders like you, serious people, are allowed to let their hair down occasionally. Yes, like normally at Christmas time. Right. <laughs> and uh, I remember one, oh, it must have been 10 years ago now, nearly. Uh, all my uh, mates in the newsreading team, Richard Baker and Richard Whitman, busy practicing for a Morkel and Wise show. That's the one, 1977. It was, uh -huh. It's still, talking of record breakers, it still holds the record for the biggest audience for a comedy show ever. 
28 million viewers. Wonderful. Must have peaked after that, do you think? <laughs> John Craven, it's been a real pleasure having you on Wimbledon. Thank you very much well, for being you. such a smashing Happy Christmas, then. And to you. Now, I've just been instructed to open this. Now, I've honestly no idea what it is. The ticket says, Happy Christmas from Windmill. It's my Christmas present from the team. Well, it's rather embarrassing opening it in full view of a television audience, but I shall do so nevertheless. It's a great sense of excitement. And, okay, I think it's China. It's well wrapped up, oh, and it's, oh, it's beautiful. Look at my windmill. Oh, how lovely. Thank you very much, windmill team. I shall treasure that. Isn't that nice? Well, we'll have it here in our set. Well, from all of us on the windmill team, including me, let us wish you a very happy Christmas. See you next week. The last word goes to Jeremy Unwin. Bye-bye. Once in royal David city stood a lowly cattle shed where a mother laid a baby in a manger for his bed. Mary was that mother bold, Jesus Christ, a little child. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God. Next Sunday, the festivities continue with a feast of food. And a menu which includes cookery from Philip Harbin, Zena Skinner and Fanny Crabbett. And there'll be a sweeping visit from the human windmill guest nutritionist, Dr Magnus Pike. That's at five past twelve next week. On BBC One now, except in Scotland, Rockspell, starring Cliff Richard. On two, Jonathan Miller continues his series, States of Mind.